But today we're in week number six of this series based on the life of Joseph. His story is in the book of Genesis. We call this uh, series Dream to Destiny. And we're picking off where we left off the last sermon. Two of Pharaoh's most trusted servants, his cupbearer and his baker, had gotten into some hot water and landed in the prison where Joseph was at. Now remember, Joseph was there out of injustice. He was falsely accused of attempted rape. And so this was a man of God that did not deserve to be there. But in God's providence, in God's wisdom, he allowed all of these things to happen because he was preparing Joseph for greater things to come. And here's a divine connection. When these two former officials of the Pharaoh land in the prison, this was a divine connection because these two were coming from the same palace where Joseph was going to. Doesn't God have a way of just networking and putting the pieces together so that we reach our destiny? That's exactly what we're seeing. In prison, Joseph discovered yet a new talent. He could interpret the dreams of others. And that's what he did for these two officials. They each had a dream one night. They were disturbed. They were confused. They didn't know what to do. Joseph helped them out. And him interpreting their dreams eventually got him out of prison. He predicted correctly that in three days, both of them would be taken out of the jail One of them would be impaled over a pole. He would be executed. The other would be restored to his position. And so what Joseph does is he tells uh, the the cupbearer, you know, the baker's the one that was going to die. So he says, hey, uh, he tells the cupbearer, hey, when this happens, not you because you're not going to be here. He says, but you over here, uh, when this happens, remember me and talk to Pharaoh about me. Do me that favor. And he's going to know that I don't belong here. And that's exactly what happened on the third day, that's exactly what happened. But the Bible says that the cupbearer forgot about Joseph. And uh, it wasn't until two years later that he remembered. So I'm going to take you through that story. But I've entitled this particular message because we're about to see a shift in the life of Joseph. Uh, this is the message that I've called managing success. Managing success. Genesis 41 verse 1. Two full years later. Pharaoh dreamed that he was standing on the bank of the Nile River. To get the whole impact of this verse, we have to consider what Joseph was feeling on that third day when he had correctly interpreted the dreams of the cupbearer and the baker. He probably thought, this is my last day in jail. He probably thought, Listen, this is my way, this is my get out of jail card, finally. In God's sovereign plan, Joseph had spent 13 years total between slavery and prison. Well, 11 back then, he ended up spending 13 years total between slavery and prison, preparing for what was next. But just when it looked like God had finally brought someone into his life that could let him out, that could deliver him, Just when it looked like the day had finally arrived, I can even imagine Joseph saying his goodbyes to the other prisoners. You know, hey guys, it was great meeting you. Man, you guys are amazing. Hit me up when you're out. You know, we'll catch up then. But but they're coming for me any moment now, any minute now. They're going to walk through those prison doors and they're going to call my name and I'm I'm, I'm going to be delivered out of this dungeon. But one minute passed and two minutes passed, one hour, two hours, one day, two days, one week, two weeks, one month. Two months, nobody came looking for Joseph for another two years. Have you ever felt like you went through a process, you endured, you picked up the necessary lessons along the way, and you were at the brink of your deliverance, you could feel it, you could sense it, you could see the light at the end of the tunnel, only to have all of a sudden another setback. Another disappointment, another delay. Just when it looked like God was about to deliver you, there's something that takes you back and you ask why. If that's you, I want you to keep something in mind. God allows different processes in our lives to prepare us, but you also need to understand that God needs to prepare the place. He needs to prepare the people to which he is taking you. And sometimes that's a whole different process in and of itself. You may indeed be ready, but your destiny may not be ready for you. We often preach that God is never late, but can I tell you that the God that is never late is never early either. And he knows the exact moment. He knows the exact time. 
And another reason why God will often delay your deliverance when it looks like it's already coming is because he wants to make sure that he is given the credit for what happens. If Joseph would have gotten out that day when he thought they were coming for him, he would have said, hey, the cupbearer hooked me up. Hey, man, it was my friend. It was a connection that I made. It was a dream that I interpreted. It was my gifting. It was my talent. And, and he had to wait another two years because sometimes God wants to take all the glory. Now, listen, God's not insecure. When I say that God needs to take all the glory, it's because his glory empowers you. His glory draws other people unto himself. When God gets the glory, he is the only one worthy of all the glory and all the honor and all the worship and all of the praise. When he gets the glory, we have the right perspective. It keeps us humble. And it keeps us in a position to continue to be blessed. Because sometimes we're tempted to think that because we have the right hookups, or because we're talented, or we have the contacts and the resources, that if we just toss a prayer on top of all of that that we have, then God is going to respond. And we're going to get to where we want to go. But God doesn't often work that way. His promise will come to pass. But when it does, he doesn't want anybody else's fingerprints on you. He doesn't want anybody feeling like you owe them any favors. Yes, God will often bring the right people, the right network of contacts and relationships and circumstances that are going to propel you toward your destiny, but he'll do so in a way that leaves no doubt that his is all the glory, that his is all the honor. So two full years passed after the cupbearer forgot about Joseph when Pharaoh had a couple of dreams. He dreamt that he was standing on the bank of the Nile River. I'm going to paraphrase for the sake of time. He dreamt seven fat, healthy cows were coming up out of the Nile River. And behind them, seven more cows that were scrawny and thin. And the scrawny, thin cows ate the big cows. He also dreamt seven heads of grain that appear, appeared shriveled and withered, swallowing up seven plump and beautiful heads of grain. And Pharaoh was confused when he called all his magicians and wise men over. None of them could decipher the dreams. And that was the moment that the cupbearer said, oh my goodness, coincidentally, my king, when I was in prison, I met a guy and he could interpret dreams. The favor of God is upon him. We need to seek him out. He surely can help you. And that's exactly what happened. Genesis 41 verse 14, Pharaoh sent for Joseph at once. And he was quickly brought from the prison. After he shaved and changed his clothes, he went in and stood before Pharaoh. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream last night, and no one here can tell me what it means. But I have heard that when you hear about a dream, you can interpret it. I love what the scripture says, that Pharaoh sent for Joseph at once. Somebody shout at once. And then it says that they brought Joseph out quickly. Somebody shout quickly. You see, we've been through the story. There was a long, maturing season filled with hardship for Joseph. But when you are ready and when you have been faithful, you got to brace yourself and get ready because success and prosperity and the goodness of God is going to be bestowed upon your life suddenly, out of nowhere, when you least expect it. Listen, I'm going to say this now. Every, every year around this time, God gives me a word for the following year. And as I was in my study this week, this was the word that God pressed on my heart. I believe that next year, for Vital and for many of you, it will be the year of God's sudden leads. It will be the year where God, out of nowhere, his blessing, you're, you, you, you're not even going to expect it. And all of a sudden, you're going to be standing in the center of your victory. Suddenly, it's when God surprises you, when he comes out of nowhere, when you couldn't have planned it, when you couldn't have created it yourself, when you couldn't have predicted it. Suddenly, it's when you feel stuck one moment, but then all at once, God shows you you've already arrived. And you may need to do in these final weeks of 2022 what Joseph did. The Bible says that he shaved and he changed his clothes because, listen, where God is taking you, there is no turning back. Shaving 
and changing your clothes is a symbolism that, that you need to prepare yourself. You got to put things in order and get rid of the things that are unfit for the palace. You got to get rid of the things that are unfit for a king. Things that won't be going with you into the next glorious season of your life. Start preparing the way because greater is coming. If you believe that, shout amen. amen. You see, Egyptians only let their hair and their beards grow during periods of mourning. So for Joseph to shave and to change his clothes was, was to say the mourning is over. The pain is over. The hardship is over. When you are prepared for your destiny, friends, you'll be amazed how quickly God will get you there. But don't think, having said that, don't think for a moment that the testing is over. Joseph had passed the test of adversity, but there was another test coming that is much tougher than adversity. And it's a test that many of us don't consider a test. It's called prosperity. Success and prosperity can be as if not more detrimental to a person than adversity. Hard times often create strong people. But strong people often create easy times. Easy times often create weak people. You see, success and prosperity, if we don't know how to handle it, can be a curse to our lives. I'm not just talking about money. Sure, God has, given, gifted, has, has gifted many believers with business acumen. But he's also given others a wealth of intellect. Inventive and practical skills in many fields. There are gifts of music, of artistry, of a, a, a literary ability. There is a wealth of personality. There are people with rich relational skills and rich and powerful organizational talent. But see, those of you that are gifted, those of you that are experienced success in any or which area of your life, many of, many of us don't know how to handle the newfound freedoms that come with that level of success. We don't know how to handle the power that comes with success. How many times have we seen accomplished leaders, pastors, athletes, businessmen, politicians? How many times have we seen them fall at the pinnacle of their success? Even in the Bible, King Saul fell when success came. David and Solomon both experienced tremendous falls when success came. You see, the temptation that comes with prosperity caused many to fail. But we see in Joseph a different kind of man. He handled the sudden elevation well, not only to his benefit, but to the benefit of many others. And what I want to do the rest of our time together is I want to share with you the principles that we can learn so that we too can manage success well. And there's four of them for those of you who take notes. Number one, glorify God in everything. Glorify God in everything. If God gets the glory, you can have the success. God is not opposed to your success. God is not opposed to your prosperity. But what God wants is the glory. That's an exchange I'll take every day of the week. Hey, give me the blessing, I'll give you the credit. Give me the victory, I'll give you the glory. Look at Genesis 41, 16. It is beyond my power to do this, Joseph replied to Pharaoh. But God can tell you what this dream means and set you at ease. You see, when the king came, acknowledging Joseph's ability to interpret dreams, Joseph corrected him and said, no, 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 it's not me, it's God. Joseph took his platform, took his opportunity to point to God in that moment. He had done the same thing earlier when interpreting the dreams of the cupbearer and the baker while in prison. He said, interpreting is God's business. You see, Joseph was totally obsessed, totally consumed with giving glory to God. Because to glorify God is to acknowledge his love and his sovereignty over your life. It is to acknowledge without him, I am nothing. And it should be our daily lifestyle. Glorifying God on a daily basis includes praising him, worshiping him, giving him thanks, coming to church. When you give glory to God, you invite the power of God to continue to manifest in your life. He is your creator. He is your provider. He's your protector, healer, strength, 
comforter, helper, counselor. When you give God the glory that he is due, all those things manifest in your life. The other thing that glorifying God does is that it draws others unto him. It attracts people to Jesus. And that, at the end of the day, is our mission. The Great Commission is to go into all the world and preach the gospel and to make disciples. Sadly, in our day and age, when people become successful, instead of glorifying God, instead of being obsessed with glorifying God and his glory, they become consumed with themselves and their own glory. Life becomes all about their brand. It's about promoting it at every juncture. We're more interested in how many people are following me than are following him. We're more interested in the likes of people than being like Jesus. Pharaoh was looking for a leader, but today everybody's looking for followers. And like Pharaoh, people are hungry for God, but unlike Joseph, the church today often fails to point them in the right direction. This was Joseph's moment. This was his golden opportunity to self-promote. This was Joseph's opportunity to say, do you know who I am? Do you know what I'm capable of? But he pointed to God because he understood it's better to be marked by God than to be marketed by man. Scripture tells us that God honors those who honor him. And this truth is important for us to adopt because every victory that we don't turn to praise turns to pride. And we all know that before the fall comes pride. If we believe that the promotion we're getting comes from others, then we're going to exalt ourselves to impress them. We might even exalt them to gain favor. But if we believe that promotion comes from God, then we're going to promote Jesus. We're going to promote God. We're going to point to him. So what did Joseph say? He said, no, I'm not the one with the answers. King Pharaoh, I'm not the one with the answers, but I know the God who does have all the answers. And we will both listen to him, and he'll tell us what he wants us to know. That brings me to point number two, how to handle success. Not only do you need to glorify God, but you need to seek divine wisdom. Seek divine wisdom. Joseph's interpretation of the dreams was this. He said, Pharaoh, the seven healthy cows and the seven healthy heads of grain both symbolize seven years of prosperity that are coming to Egypt. And the seven thin and scrawny cows and the seven thin and withered heads of grain symbolize or mean that to follow our seven years of great famine. And this famine is going to be so great that even the prosperity will be forgotten. People are not going to remember the good years they lived under your leadership when the seven years of famine come, because the land is going to be destroyed. The message from God was devastating, but Joseph was not finished. He was about to answer Pharaoh's unspoken question, because if God gives you an interpretation of a dream like that, what's the next question? The next question is, okay, what do I got to do to prevent it? What do I got to do about this dilemma? What do I need to do in light of this prediction? And let me interject here while I'm, while I'm there. Let me tell you what I believe God is speaking to the church today. The solution to the world's problems is Christ. And the church is the body of Christ. We carry the answer to the world's problems. Can I tell you? The world does not have the answer to the world's problems. Or said a different way, the world is not the solution. The world is the problem. And we have seen in recent days a new gospel emerge called so, so, social justice. And justice is great. But social justice is where the world is trying to solve the world's problems. And can I tell you, it will never work because the world is not the solution. And what happens is that the church needs to rise up. Because we're really good at pointing out problems, but we're not so good at offering solutions. You see, Joseph didn't just interpret the dream to point out a problem that was coming. He said, I also have the solution. How many of you know that we need divine wisdom? And divine wisdom comes through the word of God. Psalm 19, verse 7. The decrees of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. You need to pray. You need to read the word of God. 
so that the wisdom of the Lord will follow you everywhere that you go, making those small decisions, those big decisions, so that giving you the influence that you need to make a difference in the world. We need the church to rise up, and out of the church, we need politicians to rise up. Out of the church, we need businessmen to rise up. Out of the church, we need leaders and educators and legislators to rise up with the wisdom of God, because the world is not the solution to the world's problems. It is Christ. Divine wisdom comes through prayer. James 1 verse 5, if you need wisdom, ask our generous God and he will give it to you. If you want influence in the world, let me tell you, don't bring more problems. Bring solutions. Bring divine wisdom. And that's what Joseph did. He gave Pharaoh a solution in three parts. He said, Pharaoh, what you need to do, number one, you need to find yourself an intelligent and wise man and put him in charge of all of Egypt. Number two, Appoint supervisors under this leader to oversee the various sectors of the land. And number three, collect and save a 20% tax on all food produced during the years of abundance and store it away in order to provide for your people during the famine. You see, sometimes we can get real spiritual and we can, oh, it, it, there's a demonic influence at work and the devil's trying to destroy you and look at the wickedness in the world. Yeah, yeah. But what's the solution? What are we going to do about it? Joseph had a plan. Verse 38, so Pharaoh asked his officials, can we find anyone else like this man so obviously filled with the spirit of God? You want to gain the favor of men, even secular men? Walk in the wisdom of God. They won't be able to deny that there's something special about you. And that's how Joseph became the prime minister of Egypt. The day he was pulled out of jail, he became the prime minister of the richest nation in the world at that time. Success came suddenly because Joseph demonstrated divine wisdom in both the interpretations of the dreams and also his foresight and the solutions to manage the famine. Even Pharaoh, even somebody like Pharaoh could discern this wisdom was of divine origin. In fact, Pharaoh was the third unbeliever in the story after Potiphar and the prison warden to recognize that the Spirit of God was with Joseph. Because of divine wisdom, even the secular world around Joseph could see the administrative genius in front of them. And this brings me to point number three. How do you handle success? You've got to be a good financial steward. Be a good financial steward. You've got to have a plan like Joseph did. Because if you don't, if, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. I don't know if you guys remember... It's been a long time. It was probably our great-grandparents, for some of us, our grandparents. They had this really rare, this really primitive idea and philosophy that many today have never heard of. They had this crazy idea that if you really wanted something, you first had to save up your money before you went out and bought it. What a crazy idea, right? I know, I know, some of you are thinking, what? That's insane. Why didn't they just charge it on a credit card and pay 28% for the rest of their lives like the rest of us? <laughs> they actually believed in a thing called waiting, delayed gratification. That was the same foundational principle in Joseph's plan. He was saying, Pharaoh, you need to save in the prosperity. So that you have something to give in the adversity. Amen. Save before you spend. So simple, yet so difficult, isn't it? And unfortunately, far too many people today live their lives paying for the past rather than planning for the future. And when a famine hits, you know what the famine represents? A down season, unexpected uh, financial crisis. When, when the famine hits, the financial distress can be menacing. Creditors come after you with disturbing bills, annoying phone calls, and notices to collect. When debt roars, it often divides the marriage and cripples the future of the family. You know why? Because it's difficult to be the master of your future when you're a slave to your past. It's difficult to be the master of your marriage and your home when you're a slave to debt. 
That's what debt is. It's slavery. Proverbs 22. I'm not saying that. The word says that. Proverbs 22 verse 7. The borrower is servant to the leader. The borrower, says another version, is a slave to the lender. If you are living in debt, it means that you're living outside of the will of God. It needed to be said. Now before you walk out, the key word in my phrase is if you're living in debt. Let me clarify what this means. Having no debt does not mean an absence of bills. Debt means having bills that you do not or cannot pay. Illegitimate debt should never be the norm in the life of a person, in the life of a family or a church or a nation. Psalm 37 verse 21 says, the wicked borrow and never repay. Did you catch that? The psalmist calls it wickedness to have bills that you're unable to pay. Again, it doesn't mean that you don't have a car loan. It doesn't mean that you don't have a mortgage. And it doesn't mean that there won't be times when unexpected things like illness or natural disasters happen that are out of your control that can create legitimate debt. But illegitimate debt refers to having more bills than our ability to pay due to greed, poor planning, foolish decisions, or simply ignoring God's principles. It was Jesus who was talking about money when he said, if you are faithful in the little things, you can be trusted and placed in the, in the larger things. But if you can't be trusted in the little things, neither can you be trusted with greater things. You see, money makes a great tool, but a terrible master. Learn to have control of your finances, and don't let your finances control you. Learn to live on less than you make, and you'll be able to save, and you'll be able to give, and you'll be able to stand, and you'll be able to plan, and you'll be able to see all of your dreams come to pass. Why? Because you're stewarding faithfully, and God honors that. We need to develop that habit of saving. Even if you have to start out only saving a small amount, develop the habit of saying no to instant gratification and yes to prolonged stability. Proverbs 13, 22, good people leave an inheritance not just to their children. This is how far ahead you need to be planning, but to their grandchildren. You need to be planning for generational wealth. This brings me to number four. In times of success and prosperity, how do you handle that? You faithfully lead your family. Not only should you steward your finances, you should steward your family. We learn in the story that Joseph got married to an Egyptian woman. And two sons were born to him during the time of prosperity. Look at verse 50, Genesis 41. During this time, before the first of the famine years, two sons were born to Joseph and his wife Asenath, the daughter of Potiphera, the priest of On. Why does the writer include these details? Here's what I think. First, I think the writer wants us to know that in an age of polygamy, Joseph had one wife. I had a young man ask me the other day, why did, why did God, if God designed marriage to be between one man and one woman, why did God uh, approve of polygamy in the Old Testament? And I told him, he never approves. You're never going to find that God approves of polygamy. It was a cultural norm. And so there, there, there was some laws that legislated how husbands had to treat not just their first wife, but their second, third, and fourth wife, because that was the cultural norm. But you'll never see that God approved. God's design was always for marriage to be between one man and one woman. And we see that Joseph, even in a secular nation, an ungodly nation, where polygamy was the norm, he decided to go with God's design. And I think the writer includes this detail. He wants us to know that Joseph had just one wife. Polygamy was the norm, especially for those that could afford more than one wife. Man, if you're here and you're like, man, uh, even if you wanted more wives, you can barely afford one. Come on now. <laughs> Be honest with yourself. Joseph, though, was now the prime minister. He certainly could afford more than one wife, but again, he couldn't afford to disappoint God. Success had not changed Joseph. He was still a man of the utmost integrity. 
Second, I think that the writer wants us to read into the significance in the names of Joseph's sons. Look at verse 51. Joseph named his older son Manasseh, for he said, God has made me forget all my troubles and everyone in my father's family. Joseph named his second son Ephraim, for he said, God has made me fruitful in this land of my grief. Watch this. Joseph gave his sons names that acknowledged the work of God in his life. Manasseh means God has brought inner healing and made me forget my pain and my suffering. This is Joseph declaring, I went through a long season of hardship. I suffered a lot of betrayal at the hands of people that I love the most. But after all is said and done with, God protected my heart. He brought the healing that my spirit needed. And he's made me forget my pain and my suffering. And every time that he called out his son, Manasseh, he was reminding himself, God has healed your heart. He named his second son Ephraim. God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. They sent me here as a slave. But such is the providence and the goodness of God that even when I was meant to be cursed, God turned it around for good. And even in the land of my abandonment, even in the land of my adversity, even in the land of my affliction, God has made me fruitful. God has blessed me. God has brought prosperity because it's not about where you're at. It's about who's with you. And if you bring God into every adversity in your life, you will see the victory in Jesus' name. And every time he called his boy Ephraim, he was reminding himself, God has made you fruitful in the land of your affliction. The fact that Joseph gave his children Hebrew names in an Egyptian nation makes it clear that he raised his household in the faith. He did not care what the world around him practiced. He said, as Joseph would say one day, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And he didn't budge. Most likely his wife had committed to serving Joseph's God, an Egyptian woman. All of this to say that though prosperous, Joseph did not ever neglect his family. Which can't be said for so many people nowadays. Unfortunately today, many people today sacrifice their families at the altar of prosperity. One common trap of the enemy, and we've all said it, so I'm not judging anybody. We've all said this at one point or another. I want my children to have the things that I never had. I remember growing up, we didn't have a lot of the things that my kids had. I always loved sneakers. I, 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 I have a bunch of sneakers now. I used to have one or two pairs for the whole school year. That was it. And uh, they, weren't, they weren't brand new. Now one of the things that I have to do for my children is I, want, I like to buy them sneakers. They took after their father. But, but here's the thing. We, all, we, we always say, I want them to have the house that I never had. I want them to live in the neighborhood that I never lived in. I want them to have the luxuries that I never had. But the problem is, we often provide the things that we didn't have at the expense of the things that we did have. Because in my house, I didn't have parents that were wealthy in finances. But they were, they were strong in spirit. They were rich in values. They, they, they made it a point to spend time with us. They made it a point to lead us in, in the ways of the Lord. I know some of you, that's not your story. But can I tell you, do not give your children the luxuries that you never had at the expense of the values. At the expense of the time. At the expense of those investments that they need. Remain prayerful and vigilant. Don't let success and prosperity come and make you neglect your family. We must remain intentional and involved. The neglect of spouse and children often leads to resentment and division in the family. It appears, however, that Joseph didn't do that. He led his family in the Lord. He raised two boys that would become the heads of two of the tribes of Israel. Spend time with your children. Listen to them. Talk to your spouse. Take the family to church. Model peace and harmony in the home. Make those deposits. Make those investments. Continue to invest in them, not just materially, but emotionally and spiritually. Continue to develop their faith and set a godly example for them. 1 Timothy 5 verse 8 says this, But those who won't care for their relatives, especially those in their own household, 
have denied the true faith, such people are worse than unbelievers. And you know what the irony is? That a lot of people, we take this verse and we say, see, I need to provide for the home. But it's not limited to financial provision. You need to provide spiritual stability. You need to provide emotional stability. You need to provide direction for your home. If you fail to do that, you're worse than an unbeliever. Let me tell you why I brought this message to you this morning. Because I'm praying and believing and declaring that your breakthrough is coming. The success, the victory, the prosperity that you've been praying for. I am declaring that you will see it come to pass. You will see the goodness of God in the land of the living. I'm declaring that 2023 is going to be the year of God suddenly over your life. All of a sudden, you're going to be standing in the middle of your victory. All of a sudden, your prayers are going to be answered. All of a sudden, your dream is going to be fulfilled. And when success does come, I'm not saying if, when it does come, I need you to be ready to manage it like Joseph managed success. Glorify God. Seek divine wisdom. Be a good financial steward and lead your family faithfully. That, my friends, is how you handle power and prosperity and, and riches and, and goodness and the victory. That's how you do it properly unto the glory of God.